and welcome to our podcast on requirements engineering. Today I want to show you a very small example as a primer. My name is Christoph Ebert and I'm the Managing Director of Vector Consulting Services. Requirements engineering is a set of techniques which help us to identify need, to specify the need and elaborate the way to a solution which we then implement throughout the life cycle and in doing so also have a consistent feedback loop to the initial needs and therefore make sure that what we deliver actually satisfy the need. So requirements engineering is a technique which builds bridges between need and solution. And we are going to see how this works with this example. The example is a very simple setup which fits for all kind of industries. It's a home automation system. The home automation system consists of several lights, light scenarios which can be switched on and off. I will show you with the requirements how this works. Now some of you might think, well this is really trivial, we work in very complex IT systems. Let it be clear that we address with this example, with this small case study, all sort of industry challenges. Wrong requirements, missing requirements, changing requirements. These are the three major challenges in industry and we are going to cover those. And certainly you will see a lot of parallels. For those of you who are just starting with requirements engineering, it's the single best approach to see how to write a good requirement and maybe not the least also to see how do I validate afterwards. Because after all, a requirement itself is not everything. It's just a start. We have to link test cases to the requirement. We have to deploy a test-oriented requirements engineering. In the best possible case, the requirement serves as a test case, which allows us later on to make regressions once the product is evolving or once other requirements are changing. So let us have a look into this small setup. The product vision as I just explained, is this home automation system which address homeowners or small business owners which want to have an improved building automation which can have all kinds of automation support with IoT such as that we have burglar alarms, that we have automatic controls of um, energy consumption, energy supply and amongst others also the lighting, that means what kind of light scenarios we want to use for instance, during work hours, in the evenings, etc. The product which is what we here specify is called iHome, Home Automation, Building Automation System. And we focus on the lighting part. We are not going to look now to the whole specification, which can easily have hundreds or even thousands of requirements in practice. Of course, in the beginning, we also have to analyze the market. So we have to see who are the competitors, what are their products, and what is our product to do better than theirs. Always remember that if you are in a red ocean, that means fighting with the same features against an established competitor, that will not work. Apple was successful with the iPod or the iPad or the iPhone in red ocean markets because they developed something which was more than what the existing market had. And they left out a lot of things. So the art of requirements engineering is not to copy or do things which others have been doing, but to identify which need do I want to solve, maybe even have to create in the beginning, in order to position my product somewhere where there is no market, even in an established market. That means we turn red ocean into blue ocean, it means to open the space to have new ideas. That means market analysis is always a very key topic in the elicitation of requirements to make sure there must be one requirement which makes our customers say, wow, this is something which I have so far not thought about. This is good. It can be a service, it can be a nice feature, there can be a package of feature and service, but it should be something which is interesting. And we have of course also to see what kind of customers would be the most interesting. Now a next step would be that we start with the use cases. We have to see which typical scenarios would be used. 
we deploy use case diagrams and of course we also look into what are negative use cases like a misuse case, an abuse case or a confuse case. The negative use cases help us to identify for instance what could be security concerns. How can the system be manipulated? How can it be redirected? How can it be reconfigured? Or maybe also if you think about a confuse case what could be in a complex user interface a typical scenario where we as a human who enter information might be confused and the wrong information. Don't forget confuse cases or the user experience which is then not fully established can not only make people dislike the product, they are also a major source of problems like in medical systems. A lot of the real problems come from confusion of the users under high pressure like we have in a hospital, in a surgery and then problems start to happen. So we try the use cases which means for instance we operate the lighting, that we have to program, that means the administrative interface or we want to have certain automation. We also have to see which are the different stakeholders in the interfaces. This is also what we call the context of our system. And as I mentioned, we have maybe also negative requirements, things which we need to make sure that they won't happen. That means that we, for instance, don't want to have remote access with replay. That would be a security concern. Sometimes we can also say, well, in the first release, we don't want to have one of these use cases which are relevant. That means we cross out one, not because it's a negative requirement, but because we shift this requirement into a later situation. From here, we sort the different use cases in a requirements list. That's what we call the specification. Make sure that each single of this function follow all the same template. The template structure should start in a complete exhaustive requirement with an entry situation, the real activity, that means we have somewhere uh, a verb, the system has to do this or that, this means the requirement in the core and then we have also post conditions, that means situation which is achieved after this requirement is done. We have reduced this for the sake of the example here into the major part which is the system for instance has to create a customer specific lighting scene or has to offer a customer specific lighting system. Then we start to analyze the requirement. So we have elicitation, documentation, now we do the analysis which is we look into the effort, we look into risks and we see a perspective also what is the benefit and from this trade-off we derive priorities. That is, for instance, in, in an uh, HI requirements engineering we can make then the different increments when we deliver something. From here onwards we have to see does it fit to our budget? Does it fit to the overall package which you want to sell? Maybe this iHome is going to be sold by some distribution channel which has a specific pricing constraint and in order to fit to the pricing we have to scope the requirements so that they would fit. So we not only look to the different um, previous analysis but we also map it then to, some, to certain releases. From this negotiation onwards we can now go into more specific use cases such as we want to give details not only on a versioning but also maybe on underlying assumptions or the before mentioned pre and post conditions which are quite important for the testing, for the validation of this requirement. So this is now a full template which you for sure can imagine also in a tabular structure where we have different requirements which always fill this sort of content which is a requirement has a number a, uni a unique identifier, a key, it has a source, it has a date when it was created, it has a description, it has certainly some sort of effort estimation, it has a prioritization, it has hopefully a cost-benefit uh, analysis, a trade-off, a value for the market, but certainly also more details like a link into what would be the design or the code which implements this requirement later on, what would be the test case or several test cases which are used to check whether my system later on implements this requirement. 
From here onwards, we create a complete specification. This is one of the tangible work products of any requirements engineering. This is typically done with an office tool such as Word or with a requirements tool where typically a front end with Word is embedded. And this helps us to have with these different chapters not only the requirements, but also some, let's say, system context in which our system is operating. It shows which are the stakeholders, it shows certain constraints, but maybe also gives us a link into what standards are applicable, what are architecture constraints, it gives us a glossary, it gives us an index, etc. So that means it's like a small book, which of course is completely automatically generated, which means if we want to make later on a variant of this product, or we want to deploy it for a different market, we can reuse big portions and we make specific changes automatically with a single source. A single source is very important and this is the, actually the reason why we don't want to do it with an um, office tool like Word or Excel, because Word and Excel don't allow us this single source. It means we have to make changes. This is why we use typically a real requirements tool. Now from here onwards, let's think about testing. This is an activity which we often overlook. We want to make sure that we can test our requirement. That means for a different requirement, you see we look only into this requirement number six, which is about switching on the light. We can see in this automation system, there's a specification in which I have to push the button, or this electronic button for a certain time frame. That means we can test the as we call it sunny day scenario, that means the straightforward case, but we can also test, we have to test correlations which should be allowed or not allowed. That means in many situations we have for a single use case not only a single test case, but maybe a handful of test cases. Not too many, we don't have to test each single potential correlation with all other requirements that would explode, but at least those which are critical. In business systems, we typically test risk-oriented. That means we look, where is the money? How do we earn the money? How can we lose money? Same in safety-critical systems or embedded systems. We test what are critical situations which we want to avoid. What are the hazards? What are the malfunctions which we try to avoid? What could be, in a cybersecurity situation, attacks vectors, negative requirements? And these are the things which we test. Not everything, but focused. Where is the risk and how do we make sure that our system is sufficiently robust? Not perfect. After all, we want to make money. So we cannot always make everything perfect and test 150 test cases for the requirement. But we have to make sure that we address those things where there is the biggest risk. Now, I mentioned already that challenges are missing requirements, wrong requirements and changing requirements. So we realize after a while something has to be adapted. In this specific situation, we want to change the timing. Why? Let's just do it. We create a new version, we make this change. Of course, this change, which will ripple into a lot of other requirements, maybe existing functionality. You have to make changes in code, in design, in test cases, which all have already considered this timing. Here we learn two other things, which is, first, we should always design for change. Something which can easily change should be a parameter, should not be part of our code. Second, we have to make sure that we have traceability, a connection from requirements into where are these requirements used. With this, we have seen how to do requirements entering along the life cycle from the initial market understanding the needs into the elicitation, then a clear understanding what is our product, the context with the use cases, the different steps to implement, the analysis of the requirements, the documentation, the verification, the related test cases, but also the project management, where for instance in an HR setup would manage a backlog, we have changes, we have enhancements. And that gives us then the relationship of requirements engineering into project management. And with this being said, let me also elaborate that uh, we have further uh, uh, information available, which is uh, available with www.vector.com consulting. And we also have uh, literature like a book uh, on requirements engineering. 
we have IEEE software journals, for instance, uh, we, we have recently published a quite interesting selection of articles about design thinking, which is an HR requirements engineering. So stay tuned with this kind of information. Free information is available, podcasts and uh, trainings, which go more into depth. So I hope that you will have learned now something about requirements engineering in practice with this small example. In any case, we wish you good success with your requirements engineering and come back to us in case of further questions. Wish you good success. Thank you very much for listening.